Hey guys, Jim Vodoski here with Manufacturing Talks. I think a bunch of you may have already heard me talk about it. I've been a cyclist my entire life. Bicycling has been my number one sport uh, for decades, more decades than I want to talk about. And so it's surprising to me as I think about it that here we are at episode 75 and it is my first bicycle themed episode. But hey, we finally got to it, and we've got a great guest. His name is Tony Carklins. He leads a couple of different bicycle companies, and he's here to tell us about his one-man effort to bring bicycle manufacturing back to the United States. Great story. Um, you know, hits on a couple of my favorite themes, U.S. manufacturing, bicycling, and I look forward to hearing about it. Stay tuned, and you can hear about it, too, right here. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinoski. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. EYS Media, your digital media relations agency. Public relations, website design, digital marketing, you get found by the customers and talent who need your solutions. You get media placements and top publications, the best job candidates coming to your website, a digital presence that gets you found by the right people. Call 616-298-8798 to get started today. Okay, okay, here we are, Manufacturing Talks. I'm Jim Vinoski, your host. Thanks as always to our sponsor, DYS Media. Got a great show for you today. I'm joined today by Tony Karklins from Time Bicycle and Cardinal Cycling Group. He's CEO of both, and he's going to tell us all about the bicycle industry. Hello, Tony. Good morning, Jim. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Glad to have you on. Finally, we <laughs> worked through a few technical di difficulties there, but I think everything's working no right for, for uh, everything now. So let's get this ball rolling. Um, as I... I uh, Shared the first attempt here. I'm a lifelong cyclist myself, so it's very exciting. This is actually my first cycling theme show, which number 75. I should have gotten to it long before now, but I'm glad you're finally with us. <laughs> Thanks for inviting. Okay, so Tony, um, you got a lot to tell us about what's going on in the the cycling uh, business and the manufacturing world. But before we get into that, why don't you just tell us about your background, how you got doing what you're doing? Yeah, quick little background on me. Uh, I'm in my mid-50s. I've been in the bike industry now for a little over 40 years. So I started as a young teenager working in the neighborhood bike shop. Uh, worked my way up to being a bike shop owner at age 16. I uh, was pretty proud of that when I was in yeah. high school and running wow. my own business on the side. Um, and then I ran that business uh, up until 1999 when I decided that I wanted to move into importing and distribution. And so I started traveling to some of the European trade shows to look for brands that were established in Europe but didn't yet have a plan for America. And uh, one deal led to the other. And eventually in 2000, I was introduced to Orbea. Uh, it was an unknown brand in America at that time. And uh, talked them into letting me be the distributor for a few years. And that led to kind of some rapid growth over here. And then we turned into a 10-year joint venture. And I ran uh, North American business for Orbea for a decade. And 2014, they purchased the company uh, back and consolidated it to within the Spanish parent company. And I decided that if I was getting back in the bike industry, that uh, I would do it with a focus on manufacturing. Because during that time, um, as a retailer, and especially in my, my 14 years with Orbea, I watched most of the Western bicycle factories close and shift all their work back over to Asia. And that saddened me as I watched that because when I, mm -hmm. when I grew up in the bike industry, every bicycle brand made their own product. Everything was different. Everything was unique. Everybody had their story to tell and their reasons why. And, you know, it was a wonderful, you know, dynamic environment. And in 2014, uh, it was not that anymore. You know, everybody right. was kind of cooking in the same kitchen. Everything was basically the same in the market and everybody's stories had to change why their product was better when they were all kind of coming through the same, you know, manufacturing process in ASA. Yeah. So I decided to focus on 
manufacturing. I worked briefly with a group in um, Southern California that was attempting to do bicycle manufacturing there with some technology that came out of golf. Um, and then I moved from that to an opportunity to acquire a carbon fiber factory in Montreal, Canada, that was previously owned by Guru. And uh, we acquired that at auction and we relocated it back to the state of Arkansas with the help of the local government and some good local investors. And we launched a company there now called Allied Cycle Works. Um, and that was a very significant, you know, kind of step in the process for us to, to really learn the, uh, the possibilities of carbon fiber bicycle manufacturing in the United States. Sure. Yep. That brand is now uh, owned <clears throat> by the same cycling entity that owns Rapa by the Waltons and what they're building up in Northwest Arkansas. And in 2021, we, uh, I was able to acquire Time Bicycles from the Rosignol Group in France. And I was really excited about that acquisition because inside of that acquisition, we not only got a great brand and a unique product, but we took complete ownership of the factory that had been producing that product for 20 years. Nice. And to yep. get a carbon fiber bicycle factory that has been operational for that long with a stable and steady workforce uh, was a dream come true. Yep. Excellent. Um, so tell us just kind of a little more about first Cardinal Cycling Group. Cardinal Cycling Group was an entity that I started at the beginning of the pandemic um, when I started to notice things changing significantly in the cycling industry. And a lot of opportunities were surfacing of companies that were struggling in Europe. And I put this group together uh, and we chased several acquisitions in Europe. Um, we were we were one of the final bidders in the process for Mavic, uh, the famous wheel company. Mm -hmm. yep. And through that process, we learned of the possibility of time bicycles. And so I, I assembled this group of investment um, and, and some key employees with a focus on domestic manufacturing uh, or, or European-based manufacturing as well, mm -hmm. um, and to be able to scale that as a, as a forward-thinking competitor to Asian product development and manufacturing. Okay. It's, it's, it's a shift that I am sure is coming back. Um, yep. and, uh, this group is focused on being kind of a key part of that. And you mentioned how then that opportunity for time came along and you snapped that up. Um, yeah, that was a dream opportunity. I mean, just it, to have a great brand and a great technology and a great factory all together. Yeah, that definitely. Was a wonderful acquisition. Since you um, acquired Time, you know, just give us a real brief snapshot of what was that business? What have you done with it since? And, you know, kind of where are you going with that? So the, the Time brand was founded in 1987. And their first product uh, was, a, was a clipless cycling pedal that had rotational movement. And it was the original competitor to the look pedal. Yep. And it quickly uh, expanded their product range and they started making carbon fiber forks. So they were the brand first making these carbon fiber forks for riders like uh, Marco Pantani and uh, Mario Cipollini and anybody who was in the early, early 2000s or late 90s who was riding an aluminum race bike. These were the forks that made aluminum bikes ride better. And from that, they moved into complete bikes right around the year 2000. And uh, they built quite a good business. You know, they won the Olympics of Paolo Bettini. They won the mm -hmm. climber's jersey of the Tour de France. Tom Boonen won Perry roubaix on them. They won multiple world championships. It was sort of an it brand in cycling um, up until the point where the cycling sponsorship world really changed and the big bike companies came in with different levels of money. And that's when you saw brands like Specialized and Cannondale and Giant and Trek sort of take over the highest ranks of pro cycling. And Time was a smaller brand at that time that really couldn't play in that field. Yeah. And so their pinnacle uh, was around 2005 to 2010 in the bike industry. And sadly, the, the founder of Time passed away on a bike ride in, I believe, 2015. And the, and the company had really hard time from that because he was the driving yeah. force behind everything there. And then yeah. Rosignol, a uh, big, proud French sports conglomerate, uh, picked it up, uh, thankfully. And they dusted it off and they invested in the company. Uh, they expanded production. They improved product development. And they did a great job 
of getting it to a point. Um, but during the pandemic, it became obvious that some of the some of the assets in the cycling category were going to become available for resale. And so we were lucky enough to be able to get that from them right at the start of the pandemic. And that moment in the pandemic when we all kind of thought we were going to die, you know, we're, we're world, the world wasn't going to continue. We were actually working this acquisition. In fact, when we did the acquisition, wow. we couldn't even go to the factory for the yep. period because yep. as Americans, we weren't allowed to travel into Europe. So it was a really awkward time that we did it. But luckily, we found you know the right investment group that understood what it was that we were getting, and we were able to acquire that with uh, quite a fair bit of inventory at the moment. And that inventory became quite valuable a month or two later because you know mm-hmm. we, we went from thinking we were all going to die to everybody needed to buy it <laughs> like a month later. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was crazy Probably for us insane. because when we bought it, we thought we would just sort of stop everything for a year. Yeah. We do everything perfectly, relaunch it all perfectly, but we didn't get an opportunity to do that because what happened to us is we actually acquired one of the only operational factories of product like this in the world outside of Asia during the pandemic. Mm, well. So we had this boom <clears throat> right from the get-go because everybody else was you know, having supply chain problems or freight problems, and we had this nice little factory that was just turning them out every day. And our sales were were phenomenal for the first two years of our acquisition. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, you know, we we tripled and quadrupled previous year's production numbers in there, and it was a great moment for us. And now, now in 2023, we finally get to start making you know real changes to the product and making steps forward here, because now we have the we've built the team of the size. We're ready to take it to the next level. Right. Yep. Uh, and and I'm gonna take a little tangent here. You mentioned some names that I'm very, very familiar with a few minutes ago. And some of our listeners might not be, um, those pro racers and pro racing teams that you mentioned, um, in the bike industry more than maybe any other sporting industry, that collaboration you guys have with those pro riders and teams really drives this technology that then kind of flows down to ordinary schlubs like me and we yeah, can I mean, see these really cool things happening, right? Yeah. When you when you produce a carbon fiber bicycle and Paolo Bettini wins the Olympic gold medal on it, you validated it as high as humanly possible. Yeah, yeah. And, and eventually uh, I get to ride great, something close to that for much less money. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I have, in, in the acquisition, we actually got Paolo's Olympic gold medal bike. We're gonna Did put it really? in a future museum we're working yeah, on. Yeah, very cool. I know you're familiar with uh Jamie over there at Hotel Flandrian. And yes, you just said that made me think about his collection. His collection. Yep. Very cool stuff. Now, you you mentioned early on that whole move back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s that happened where everything went to Asia. And I definitely want to drill into that because that's changing now. And obviously, you know, we hear a lot in the general manufacturing world about reshoring and things like that. But you've been a key driver of this move in the cycling world to bring manufacturing either back in yeah, Europe or back to the U.S. I've been on this since 2014. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's my mission. I, I, I know it's coming. I know it's the right thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, we've we've been working hard to be at the forefront of that. And so what drove everything overseas? I know most of us probably <laughs> yeah, have some familiarity. Um, what, when carbon fiber hit the cycling industry, every bicycle company out there was basically a metal shop mm-hmm. yeah cutting welding bending painting assembling pretty basic stuff you know yeah. maybe steel maybe lightweight aluminum aluminum a little bit more high tech but still cutting bending welding painting that was it right. so carbon fiber comes in it definitely it immediately changes you know professional cycling there was something that was lighter, that was stiffer, that was mm-hmm. faster to race. And within like an 18 month period in performance cycling, it completely pivoted to that material. And none of these Literally. factories knew what it was. Yeah. So yeah. What, what is carbon fiber? You know, that the, it, it, it did not deploy through the normal channels in the bike industry. Mm-hmm. It came into cycling through Asian production where they had been using those processes in tennis and in golf and some other sporting equipments first. And so they had built huge brands around that. I mean, the biggest tennis brands, you know, the biggest golf brands, you know, they had that technology before the cycling industry did. And when it hit, 
it hit hard and you couldn't sell a titanium bike. You couldn't sell yeah. an aluminum bike anymore because it wasn't the high performance material. And so one by one, they all just shut down production and shipped it all over to essentially three, four, five companies that were all using the same process, same materials, same technology. And it and they never looked back. All right. Yeah. And then that drove that sameness of design that you were talking about that made the bike world really boring there for a while, right? It, yeah, it did. Because, I mean, you know, when carbon hit the bike industry, I mean, the, the, most of the engineering, most of the design was all coming out of Asia because those are the people that knew how to work with the materials. They knew how to, they knew how to process it. They knew how to create the tools for it. And so that's when everything just started kind of looking the same, you know? Yeah. And so tell us now it's begun coming back. You mentioned Europe has now. Yeah, established. Europe has done a fantastic job of bringing cycling manufacturing back. And so what is it that they've done that made them successful? The most significant thing that they've done is they've put the right tariffs in place in the right categories to incentivize, you know, Europe, which is far and away the world's largest cycling market. Okay. They, you know, an, an e-bike, for example, if you're buying an e-bike out of China and bringing it into Europe, your duty is 67%. If you buy a Chinese e-bike and you bring it into the United States, your duty is zero. Okay. So, you know, e-bike is a, is a crystal clear and fast growing mode of just normal transportation in Europe. And those are now all mostly being manufactured, certainly assembled um, inside of Europe. And it's it's a very healthy and growing part of the manufacturing segment in, in Europe. You see big clusters right now in Portugal, in Bulgaria, in Lithuania. You got quite a bit through Germany, although it's pretty expensive labor there in Germany. I would say that Portugal right now is in the lead um, far and away in what they're doing. Um, great labor force there, um, very industrious company uh, country, and there's you know almost 50 different companies in the cycling industry manufacturing there now. Wow, yeah, that's not a large country. No. Uh, no. And so, if we look at what Europe's done, then what should the U.S. manufacturers be looking at potentially to bring it back on? Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is, it's getting more expensive to produce in Asia anyway. It's getting more yeah, right produce in Asia. Everybody watched and learned how difficult it is now to ship products around the world. Right. So there's a natural shift just because of that. Then you have all the geopolitical issues over there. Mm -hmm. You know, China is producing, you know, most of the product in the cycling industry. And, yep. you know, that is that is an uncomfortable situation and seems to be, you know, increasing. And some of the other countries that labor uh, bicycle manufacturing has moved into have even, you know, some more significant uh, political issues. You know, uh, there's a lot of bicycle manufacturing now in Myanmar and places like that. Yep. So those are not really stable places for long-term production. Yep. So, you know, you, um, I'm going to jump in. You talked about the craziness of the pandemic time and, and we've mentioned on the show a number of times that whole dynamic of not being able to get things from these far flung supply chains. I have a personal story in the cycling world. My wife wanted, a new bike right as the pandemic hit that spring. I went into our local shop and lo and behold, talked to the salesman. And he's like, I, I think we've got exactly what she wants here. And we go look at this bike. She rides it. She likes it. We buy it. I went back two weeks later. They did not have a bike on the shop floor. Yeah. It was insane. And they didn't have anything for months. So, yeah, that's another driver yeah, for sure. When you have the benefit manufacturing you know first of all you have you can avoid the duties because you're right. keeping right. those jobs here in the country you have a very high level of flexibility with your inventory you know if you're painting yep. here as well you're not really stuck to these year models where companies have to buy huge quantities one or two years in advance you have a much mm -hmm. more normal flow of product you're producing daily instead of these certain windows of the year where you get huge ocean containers in they come fill up these fulfillment centers and then the brands push all that product into stores and they kind of bloat the whole channel. And it's just because there's not smooth daily manufacturing going on in the United States. Interesting. So it doesn't, it doesn't work in all categories. I mean, there are some categories where you really cannot compete with some of the Asian 
manufacturing options. You know, because yeah. Some, so let's let's talk <laughs> about that. What what, you know, what are like the strengths that we have? Bicycles. I mean, aluminum bicycles to make a premium modern aluminum bike, it's it's significant investment in machinery to do it for one that's mm -hmm. globally competitive, and there's not that much. Um, there's not that much assistance to really be able to do that competitively in the States. So we see in Europe right now, there's quite a bit of aluminum robotic manufacturing moving into the bike industry. That's the game changer, yep. but it is a huge capital investment to do it. Yep. But when you, when you see it in motion and I, I've been in several of them and taken some government people on tours of certain places to see these things, it's, it's, there you see the future of it. That's how e-bikes are going to be made. Mm -hmm. No, you know, right. and that can happen quite easily here in the United States. It just, you know, when, when the right programs are in place for the big companies to make that jump, that'll happen. Carbon fiber manufacturing is a little bit trickier because it's so man hour um, dependent. You know, it, it's typically 30 to 40 man hours to produce a carbon fiber bicycle frame. And when you're dealing with Chinese labor at the two to three dollar level to American labor at the twenty four to thirty dollar label, um, you know, times thirty five hours, it's a huge component of the actual cost of manufacturing carbon fiber. So if you're going to do things in carbon fiber in the United States, you better be deploying some processes that are not the normal path in the bike industry. Right. Yep. That's a big project that we're working on right now with time. We're putting a manufacturing facility in South Carolina that is based on braiding carbon structures and resin transfer molding, which is a completely different method than anybody uses in Asia in the bike industry. Interesting. Everything yep. there is bladder molding and prepreg. And right. our way is basically what the automotive and aerospace sectors use. Okay. So um, very technical project, but one that when we get just the right recipe developed for it, we should be able to deploy something that is as good or better than any of the Asian product out there, but produced very competitively within the United States. So we're very excited about that. Our first proof of con uh, concept trials for that are going to be in the month of November. Okay. Very exciting. Very. Now, you talked about like Portugal being this center of excellence for European uh, manufacturing. have to believe then in the U.S. there's going to be certain places that this work can center and, and get advantages. How do you yeah. see that kind of shaking I mean, out? The, uh, the, the historic cycling industry in America is, is clustered mostly in Colorado, California, places like that where the riding is great but those are not necessarily the best places to actually have a cluster like this develop yep. because you need, you know, your, your competition is China, right? So you have to right. be the, in the most cost efficient places that are very well connected with ports and most importantly have a thriving labor force, you know, and that's, that's really challenging to do um, in places like California because just the cost of living is astronomical over there. Mm -hmm. So, um, we see that the probable location for the North American cluster will be somewhere uh, from Southern Virginia down through Northern Florida, because you've got great port connectivity there. You've got a really strong workforce down there. So it's where you see a lot of the automotive moving in as well. I was just thinking that same thing. Yeah, you've absolutely. Got, you've got you know, decent climate for year round, everything there. But yep. then you've also got this awesome connectivity between Europe and that part of the United States. So you have, you know, 14 to 17 day boat service connecting those, those two parts, those two continents. Mm -hmm. And those two continents, when you combine them, that is the cycling industry, yep. you know, United States and Europe, but that connectivity. The other area that we think um, has a good chance of, of, a, of a cluster for it is in and around the Detroit area mm -hmm. because of, you know, all of the, uh, e-mobility development that's happening there, auto-funded because of the workforce uh, and just because of the transportation infrastructure that, you know, everything was built to come in and out of Detroit. Yep. And that's another place where this can very, this can happen in a very competitive way. Well, and you guys picked up Detroit bikes a while back. I wrote about we that. We acquired that um, yep. for that purpose about 22, 23 months ago. 
Uh, How's that going so far? You know, that was an interesting ride because we bought it right in the middle of the pandemic when everything was crazy. <laughs> More drama. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, and then that category specifically is one of the categories that got crushed the most yeah. with excess inventory at the end of the pandemic. Yeah. Everybody that was going out to buy a thousand dollar urban bike, they all bought it in the first half of the pandemic. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, we've repositioned that company now in Detroit where it's still manufacturing uh, and selling the Detroit bikes brand. But what it's mostly doing now is that we have five customers in there that are using that platform for their manufacturing assembly and fulfillment, mostly nice. these products. Yep. Because there are a lot of people that are trying to start American assembly and American manufacturing but the, the startup expense of doing that is astronomical for most mm -hmm. of these bike companies. So we've done service agreements with these companies to allow them to come do it inside of our infrastructure there. And it's been really a fascinating project for us. And we believe it's a, a platform that will grow quite significantly with that offer. Because now we have European companies uh -huh. that see that there's a place in the United States where they can ship you know, componentry and raw materials into that can be manufactured and assembled and fulfilled there so they can run North American business through that facility from their their headquarters in Europe. Yeah. Um, are there opportunities to expand what we can make in the U.S.? I mean, I, I think about SRAM, for example, has done some of that over here. Uh, but I know to your earlier point, there are things that, that at least for the foreseeable future, are going to be um, kind of out of reach for the U.S. You know, it's um, on the traditional bicycle drivetrain componentry. I don't see that really ever coming over to the United States. Yep. Um, it's it's too well developed, and uh, Shimano and SRAM they've got their they've got their plans for it. I'm sure. Um, what I think is going to happen here uh, will will first be frame sets and certainly wheels. But now because of e-mobility um, and soft mobility products, traditional drivetrains are changing rapidly. And that, I mean, that, that movement is the biggest part of the future of cycling industry. Yep. And that movement is not necessarily dependent on Shimano and SRAM rear derailleurs. Yep. They are using completely other platforms for their drivetrains. They're using completely other braking systems and you know, we see the motorcycle industry coming in. We see the auto industry coming in. And that generation of product, for sure, you will see that manufactured in the United States. Interesting. And, you know, I think a, a while back traded some stuff about wheels as well. Yeah, I mean, wheels, wheels have uh, definitely a place for manufacturing here in the United States. I've got a friend of mine in South Carolina just started in the aluminum, uh, aluminum extrusion business for rims. That's Boyd Cycling there. That was a really exciting nice. project that he did. Yeah. There's a few people making composite rims here. Uh, and I believe there's a lot more of that coming in the very near future. And plus, we see, we see new technologies like thermoplastics and short fiber injection coming into the wheel industry. Chris King and, and Bond Trader just uh, launched products using that technology. That's You'll see a lot more of that in the United States soon. Yeah, and it's funny. I mean, there's been so much change in the recent decades that you kind of think that, oh, surely, you know, we've done all the innovation we can, but that's definitely not the case, right? No, I mean, material science is is amazing. And, you know, this the, the things that end up into the cycling industry usually get, you know, released into the general sporting goods sectors, you know, from military advancement, university mm -hmm. advancement. And it's a, it's a continual flow of improved materials and process and technologies there. I mean, yep. it, it, there there will be several yeah. more generations of much lighter, much stronger, much safer, you know, much much higher performance. Yeah. So let's swing back to time and and think about the future. You know, what are your plans for growth of the business today? Do you guys? Think about like other acquisitions. Where do you, where do you see that going in the next five, 10 years? I mean, our, our biggest project for the next two years is getting our South Carolina factory operational on that scale. You know, we we have uh, we acquired a 140,000 square foot facility there earlier this year. We've just finished reconditioning most of it and we will become fully operational kind of quarter by quarter throughout to 2024. And that will bring us more capacity with our form of manufacturing than the time brand 
who can really handle because the time brand is a, <clears throat> it's a halo brand, you know, it, it's, yep. a, it's a, it's a, it's a Porsche, it's an Aston Martin, you know, yeah. it's a Bentley. And so that can only grow globally to a certain point. Yep. But as, as we grow the manufacturing capacity with high pressure resin transfer molding technologies in there, then we are, you know, certainly looking for category expansion through probably other brand acquisition. Mm -hmm. We would love to see, you know, a mountain bike company join what we're doing, or certainly an e-bike company join what we're doing. Um, and we're and we're constantly in the market, kind of looking for those opportunities. Good. Yeah. And, you know, I'm an advocate for U.S. manufacturing and I'm a cyclist. So everything you're saying, <laughs> you have a big fan right here. Yeah. I mean, I, I look forward to bringing you down um, and showing you that facility probably yeah. do it in second quarter next year, because then I'll be able to show you some some really is interesting technology in there that just doesn't exist anywhere else in the bike industry. Yeah. yeah. And I would definitely definitely want to come down and see it for myself, because um, we talk a lot on this show about how innovation is a big piece of what's going to allow American manufacturing to expand. Yeah. And you're right. It's not going to be the manual labor of the past that's no. gone it, forever. It is not because you, 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 you won't win that way. You're not nope. going to be competitive that way. Well, and we don't want to win that way. True. Right. Those were the drudgery jobs of the past that no one really wants to do here anymore. And God bless them for that. Um, what haven't we touched on, Tony? Let's see. What have we not touched on there? Um, well, we covered most of it there. Well, it's been an amazing story. And uh, obviously, I, I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing. And I wish you all the success. Um, Thank you very much. hearing more about it. I think there's probably some more uh, Forbes stories that can come out of what you have going on. So let's suddenly keep in touch with that. And certainly, any uh, time you want to report back here on Manufacturing Talks, you're always welcome. Great. I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Uh, and of course, thanks as always to those of you out in the audience who've joined us. I appreciate it. Um, Tony has brought us some really intriguing and uh, groundbreaking to me stories about innovation and manufacturing and bringing bicycle biz back to the US. Now, um, I can't promise that all our guests are gonna be as intriguing as Tony's been, but they're all gonna be intriguing. So join us every Tuesday. We'll be here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vinosky. Watch for new episodes dropping every Tuesday. And don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe.